Hi, my name is Emily Singer Lucio, and I'm the ADA 504 coordinator for the university. Hello, my name is Laura DiMarco, and I am a first year graduate student in the library science program. Thanks, Laura. So we're here today to talk a little bit with Laura about what it's like to have a disability at the University of Maryland. So Laura, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. All right. So this is my first semester on this campus, but I ha did go to the Shady Grove campus for two years, one of which was entirely online because of current events. So that was fun. Uh, more specifically related to disability, I'm autistic. Some of you may have discussed that with me at the Next Now Fest Human Library a couple of weeks back, and uh, we'll get more into that sort of thing later. But I've been, I was diagnosed in fourth grade. I understood what it meant in eighth, and I started being open about it and trying to be something of an advocate somewhere around end of eighth grade, beginning of high school, and I've been doing that ever since. Great, thanks. So it sounds like uh, you've this has sort of been a process for you in, in sort of learning about your disability and, and sharing it with people. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like learning you had a disability? Yeah, well I can try. It's been a while. I where do I start? Okay, so I grew up in a very rural, middle of nowhere area, whole bunch of trees, not too many people, and they had resources available for things like social skills training and all that sort of thing, but you know it was resources in a tiny rural school, it's only going to go so far. And um, I, f I got my diagnosis when I was nine, which is actually considerably late for an autism diagnosis. That's something of a long story, but you can mostly chalk it up to sexism in medicine. And uh, I didn't really, I don't recall if it was ever shared with me what it meant, what the word meant, or at the time, I was specifically diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which is no longer a thing. And I never really got to have in-depth discussions with my parents or my teachers about what that was. As far as I knew, Asperger's was either the subject of a couple of kids' books we had on hand or the worst McDonald's order in the entire <laughs> world. I'll have a Diet Coke and two Asperger's, please. <laughs> It wasn't until I got to middle school, eighth grade specifically, and this is around when I moved to Maryland. It was the end of my first year in Maryland. It was April. I remember that. I was sitting on the bus coming home from a trip from chorus class, and I told the girl who was my best friend at the time that I was autistic. I don't remember why I told her, but I remember that after saying it, it, just saying it that one time made it infinitely easier to talk about it going forward, which made it easier to research it and learn more about it. And then I went to college and met a bunch more people like me. And now uh, I have a, the, largest and most solid friend group that I ever had, which started in my freshman year of college and kept going. And, you know, the old saying about birds of a feather, not one of my friends is neurotypical. So that's a fun fact. And, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and not everybody is autistic specifically, but knowing the things about myself that relate to my disability and then might circle back has helped me connect with my friends with ADHD or dyslexia and find the overlap and oh yeah I do that which has made our relationships a lot stronger and uh, so I guess the 
short answer is yes, it has been a journey, but I'm glad I took it. And my only regret is that I'd been able to get to the point about talking about it uh, sooner than I did. Great. That was great. Thank you. So I want to follow up with one question. Um, for those people who may not know what autism is, could you explain for some people what autism is? Oh, yeah. Should have done that first. Okay. That's okay. So autism is, okay, it's classified as an intellectual disability, but I think that's more in the sense of, you know, diagnoses are always shoved into little boxes, whether or not you know, the way cats climb into, you know, uh, little salad bowls and make themselves fit. <laughs> but uh, autism, so basically my brain developed funny. We have no idea why. We have no idea what causes autism and whether we should be finding out is a big debate in the autistic community. But my brain developed a little differently, and so I um, tend to have issues with sensory processing. I uh, tend to process information half a beat slower than everybody else. I um, am not great with social skills. I mean, I'm working on it, and I consider myself a nice enough person, but uh, as far as little details like tone of voice go I occasionally slip I um and you know various other things like that oh I'm not great with space that's the other one I I'm not great with proxemics I tend to knock into things a lot um but you know that's just my experience and uh the full name of the disability is autism spectrum disorder and the key word there is spectrum so this will go a lot faster if from here on out uh, you just assumed based on my personal experience and just speaking for me is attached to everything I say. But a lot of the stuff I did mention, uh, difficulty with space, sensory processing, difficulty with eye contact is another one, tend to be common markers. And then the spectrum part is how much those common markers impact each individual person, uh, which ones show up at all, and which less common markers might take their place or be there in addition. Am I making sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thanks. Great. Um, and, and also just to clarify, I think because you mentioned it, um, you know, people used to use the term Asperger's, right, as part of autism, and that's when they changed it to autism spectrum, right, and the, and the characteristics of, of what used to be under um, Asperger's sort of fall under the spectrum now. Yeah. Do you want me to elaborate? Nope, that's okay. I just wanted to clarify that for people who may have, you know, not been aware that there was that change um, in the categorization, so I just wanted to clarify that. But I, I wanted to follow up on something you said in terms of you've talked a lot about how you know, you were diagnosed and then and then later in life how things changed when you moved. How is it, how has having, ha, been, being on the autism spectrum um, impacted you differently at different stages of your life? Mm, let me think. Okay. So I will die on the hill that Autism is not a tragedy or a burden or a Dustin Hoffman movie. <laughs> um, and in and more specifically, uh, my being like autistic, Rain Man. <laughs> yes. Yay, you got that reference. I did. Um, more specifically, I believe my being autistic has influenced me positively and negatively, not just oh, there's negative and then there's this thing. But I, in my experience, I have seen some benefits to being autistic. Um, I guess I'll start with the negative just to get it over with. I had a lot of trouble making friends as a kid. Um, I was definitely the weird kid in the room, second only to my brother, who's also on the spectrum and presents differently. And so I was 
generally that weird guy's slightly less weird sister. And um, so that was not fun. And I, uh, sensory processing issues were much worse when I was a kid. I, um, I couldn't stand bright light, which was unfortunate because I always lost my sunglasses. I used to scream at television static and I, any food with like a mushy texture, I to this day cannot handle. I've gotten over television static, but bananas are the worst. No mashed banana- potatoes? Mashed potatoes I'm okay with, <laughs> but bananas, soggy bread texture, like, um, like cereal mm. or Tris Leches cake. And taste is also a sense. Uh, so I hate bell peppers. That's another thing. Um, so it's just kind of, if you, if I were to put it into a list, a lot of it is the little stuff. I mean, you start with the super negative stuff, like not having a lot of friends because that's what humans are hardwired to remember first. And then from there, it's just a lot of little, you know, it's good to know. And then when I finally understood my diagnosis, oh, there's an explanation for that. Um, but I'll wrap up the answer to the question with my favorite thing about being on the spectrum. Uh, my two favorite things. One I already mentioned is it gives me another chance to connect to my friends and strengthen our friendships. Um, I, I may not have had a lot of friends growing up, but ever since I got to college, I can count on, I can count at least half a dozen people who I am close enough, like pick them up from the airport close. That's my metric for having really good friends. Um, and that's, that's a good metric. <laughs> and the second thing is I'm very proud of my memory. Uh, autism can have different effects on people's memories. Uh, in my case, my long-term memory is rock solid. I um, my favorite parlor trick that I never get to use is that I once memorized the first page and a half of the Hunger Games verbatim. Oh my god. And I can still do that. I haven't picked up my copy in years and I can still do that. Wow. That's and impressive. Thank you. And then the last the last positive, which can be a negative depending on the context, but I think that's true of just about everything. Um is I'm one of the types of autistic people who is hyper empathetic and uh, so I having that sense of empathy has uh, I'm kind of proud of that too that that's a great skill there are so many people who don't have that these days so having that is, is a gift so I would kudos to you for that what are some preconceived ideas you think people have about you about me personally or about autistic people in general? I'll let you choose that one. Mm, okay. Okay, I can answer both at the same time. Okay. A lot of people who don't know autistic people get their sense of what my disability is like based on media. And unfortunately, that tends to a lot of hegemonic portrayals, which is why I was putting so much emphasis on the spectrum part earlier, is, um, you know, white, cisgender, male, um, with the exact same presentations, the exact same symptoms, the exact same special interests, usually STEM-related. Um, basically, we're only just getting past the idea that autistic people don't all look like Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory. Huh. Um, and I don't even think that uh, media and writers are even close to past it yet, but I have seen a bit of progress. Consequently, when they see someone like me, who is a woman for one thing, and more humanities minded and I picked up a lot of my 
interpersonal skills from a background in theater and, you know, basically not Sheldon Cooper, I have had a couple of people tell me, wow, I had no idea. You don't seem autistic. You don't, I didn't realize, you don't present that much. And I get it. You're either making an observation or you think you're complimenting me, but it's really not a compliment because it saying you don't seem autistic as if it's a good thing implies that autistic people who can't pass are somehow less deserving of support and acceptance. And I know it's not intended that way nine out of ten times, but, you know, now you know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so what have been some of your, what do you think some of the biggest challenges have been and how have you worked through them? Besides the one I just mentioned um, and the difficulty making friends, um, I think a challenge I'm still having issues with is, oh, I've got a good one. Oftentimes, autism can be comorbid with mental illness, anxiety and depression most commonly, and in my case that is true. I, uh, I do have generalized anxiety disorder, and I'm in treatment for it now, but I kept putting that off for reasons that make me very irritated at my younger self. Um, so that anxiety element has definitely been an issue. Um, so I'm here to tell you, if you were considering looking into medication or therapy and you were nervous about it, please don't be. There's no shame. I promise half the people you know are on something. And once you get the dosage right, it works like a charm. So definitely finding, uh, getting over that challenge or at least working through it because it is a journey. Um, the biggest thing was finally saying to myself, hey, wake up. You can get professional help. You need professional help. It's right there and go right ahead. It'll, you'll thank yourself later. Thanks. That's great. Um, I want to ask you one last question. Where do you see the world of autism in the, in 10 years from now? Um, I'm going to have to answer that with, with another question. Do you mean the world of autistic people, autism research, parents of autistic children? You know, like, that's a really good point because, you know, that, that could go a number of different ways. So I think that's that's good. Um, I kind of want to leave that up to you. I mean, I know there's a lot to be done in terms of research. Um, but I guess what I'm looking for is where do you see that in terms of how people view autism in the future? Because, you know, I think it's relatively new in this in the world of disability right it's one of the you know you don't agree no it autism as a concept has been around since 1951 i if i'm interpreting what you're saying correctly the idea of autism acceptance is relatively new mm -hmm. that i would agree with okay um and to answer your actual question honestly i have no earthly idea um, the autistic community has a great deal of pride in ourselves and the way our brain works and things like memory and hyper empathy and connecting to each other and you know autistic pride day is in June but the outside world does considerably scare me because it seems like every time there's progress like that picks are short where the autistic character is a black girl who doesn't talk. Um, there also seems to be considerable and very frightening steps back. So 
I'm not going to say that I don't see improvement happening in 10 years. I do. But I see it being much too slow for my liking and occasionally going backwards. And I would love to see more uh, more of our non-autistic allies um, helping to do something about that. Things like calling your senators to make sure that our needs are included in health care bills and researching autism organizations to make sure that they're actually interested in helping us before you donate and that they're led by autistic people. And if you're not sure or you're afraid of something up, screwing something up, um, you know, you're always welcome to ask. There's all sorts of trusted organizations that answer the questions you probably have all the time or YouTube videos by autistic creators. We're out there, we're talking, and we're not expecting anyone to know everything that's physically impossible. But I would love to see more people listening. And I... I believe that it, that's possible in the next 10 years, is more people listening, and with that, more progress on a larger scale. But it's not, it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be comfortable, and the sooner we accept that, the better. Thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Thank I you do for hope that me. the you're welcome. Um, I do hope that this conversation opens people's eyes to what it's like to live with a disability. Um, and for more information about resources at the University of Maryland about disability, please go to accessi our accessibility website at accessibility.umd.edu. Thanks everyone for listening, and and Laura, thank you again for a great conversation. Thank you, Emily. <laughs>